Uh, we're going to turn again to God's, uh, God's living, precious, holy word this morning. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5 and then to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, when you're finding those two uh, references, uh, did you know that that uh, chorus or song that we've just sung, that this little light of mine, was originally, uh, as, as Sandra rightly pointed out, that really it was a children's song. And it was written 103 years ago. Imagine that, 103 years ago. And it's been recorded, and it's been performed by singers as uh, diverse as, can you believe it, Bruce Springsteen uh, recorded it. Uh, a choir, the Boys Choir of Harlem, a black choir, they recorded it. And uh, it was uh, sung one time as a duet song by Brenda Lee and Charlie Daniels. Lots and lots of people love that song, uh, but it's never been sung as well as by the congregation at Kutil Christian Fellowship this morning. Um, thank you for, for singing that. The week before last, uh, uh, we looked at how Jesus had reminded his disciples that they were the salt of the earth. Say salt. 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 Turn to someone and say, you're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Yes. Uh, and if you missed that message, you can listen to it again. You can watch it actually on uh, the church's uh, YouTube channel. We're, we're, we're well into modern technology here in Kutel. Uh, and Keith uploads uh, the Bible study, and you can watch those as well, and, and the, uh, the Sunday serve uh, messages on Kutel Christian Fellowship YouTube. Go to YouTube and just type in Kutel Christian Fellowship, and you'll be able to see it. But basically, Jesus was saying that. We are to be salt that preserves, that seasons and flavours and penetrates into that which it is applied <clears throat> and to help make other people want to taste and see that God is good. That was what we shared uh, uh, two weeks ago. Well, today we're going to explore what Jesus meant when he went on to say and, and tell his disciples that they were not only the salt of the earth, but also that they were the light of the world. And that's why our, our first couple of songs and then this last song uh, references light. So again, just turn to someone and say, you're the light of the world. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because these two things, salt and light, are what it means to be a Christian disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. So let me read you uh, from first of all from Ephesians chapter 5 just a few verses in uh, chapter 5 verse 8 for you were once darkness but now you are the light in the Lord live as children of light for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them for it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then turning to uh, Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 5, uh, which is part of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, of course. And uh, we've read these verses two weeks ago, but we'll read them again. Uh, where Jesus says in verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bush, a bushel. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and praise your Father who is in heaven. Uh, I just remembered as I was uh, reflecting on that message a couple of weeks ago about you are the salt of the earth. Do you remember, before, you know, years ago, and though there are some of us here who remember this, but you young people that are here, younger people won't remember this, but you know, there used to be just one flavour of 
potato crisps. And you would open up the bag and you'd find a little blue package in it. Do you remember that? No, you don't. You don't remember that? Maybe it was just up north. But David, do you remember? Yeah, a little blue, little blue package. It was twisted. And you'd have to open it up and inside was salt. And you'd just empty it into the packet of crisps and you'd give it a shake and you had salted, salted chips or potato crisps. And of course now there's a multitude of flavours. But back in the day, in my day, um, all you could get was uh, plain crisps or salted crisps. And you had to salt them yourself. Um, that's how it was. But anyway, uh, those verses that we read there uh, are one of the few texts where Jesus makes it clear and, and helps us to evaluate uh, just how real our devotion and our dedication to him really is. Uh, we can hold this, this scriptural template up to our lives to see how, how real, how authentic our day-to-day -day walk with God really is. Are we the salt of the earth? Are we uh, you know, the light of the world? Uh, these verses can help us to see to what extent we are matching, matching up our actions uh, and attitudes to the image of Christ. And that can be a hard thing to, that can be a hard thing to determine uh, at times because uh, if you think about it for a minute, what, what does a real Christian actually look like? What does a real Christian actually look like? And how does genuine discipleship uh, tend to show itself? Um, way back in the early days of the church, uh, when they couldn't really speak much openly, um, they used to have a symbol, the sign of the fish, uh, that they would use to show that uh, you know, this was a Christian house or we, they were Christians. And I wonder today, uh, sometimes you'll see that little fish sign on the back of a car. Does that indicate for sure that the, the owner of the car is a bona fide fisher of men? Can you be sure about that? A lot of people these days, and maybe for a long, long time, have worn a cross as a piece of jewellery. cross on a chain around their neck. If you see someone with a cross on a chain around their neck, however plain it might be, however ornate it might be, does that show and tell you that that, that person's a committed follower of Jesus? Can you be sure? Or what about styles of worship music? It's a big thing these days. If someone prefers to clap like we've been doing or raising their hands in praise, is that an indication of the depth of their love for Jesus? Or, or some people prefer to stand reverently and sing from a hymnal. Uh, are they more likely to be a truly devoted follower of Jesus? How do you know? That's really what I'm asking. It can be very confusing. Not to say subjective. We all have our own thoughts, I suppose, to determine what a real Christian looks like or acts like. And so Jesus gives us a very credible diagnostic uh, uh, a way of finding out in these four verses that, that we read, verses 13 through 16. Uh, when we were moving house uh, just this past weekend, uh, maybe six months ago, uh, we had bought some kitchen units that were on sale. They were very, very cheap, actually. The, the cabinet maker was trying to get rid of them. They had no doors, but they were good kitchen units. And we bought a whole lot of them, thinking we were going to need them. But it ended up that we didn't need them all. Uh, I think when we had the kitchen uh, sorted, uh, they used maybe a couple of them, but, but they brought customized stuff. And so we had all these kitchen units left, assorted sizes and everything. And uh, anyway, Helen put it up on, on, on social media. Uh, if anyone wanted them, we could take them for free because we, we had nowhere to put them, uh, to take them with us. And the house we were leaving wouldn't have wanted them uh, in the shed that was there. So uh, anyway, uh, this, this fellow and his wife decided they would take them. They were renovating an old house and they would take them. Portuguese uh, couple actually. And so I went over to the old house on the Saturday night and uh, they came along and he brought a trailer and uh, uh, they were so grateful. Lovely, lovely couple. Lovely couple. I almost 
thought they were Christian, but I didn't know. That's what I'm saying. You just don't know sometimes. But anyway, when he when he he was that grateful when he was leaving uh, before uh, before he got back into his van with the big trailer loaded up, and actually he took some other things that we had there that we we're trying to get rid of as well. He was so grateful. Uh, he went back to his van and he came back up to me and I thought he was going to hand me some money, but he didn't. Um, <laughs> um, but he handed me a calling card or a business card. And he was a mechanic by profession. Uh, he was self-employed. And he said, that's my car. Uh, if you ever need any work done to your car, he said, just give me a call. Because we're so grateful. And he said, I've got all my own stuff. He said, I've got my own diagnostic machine. Um, that's what reminded me of this, my own diagnostic machine and I can just plug it into any car, any manufacturer, any model and tell you what's wrong with it. And so these verses are, are really 13 through 16, it's, it's Jesus diagnostic, if you like, of, of who we really are or should be. And you remember from, from last week or, or two weeks ago I should say that Jesus in essence uh, faces us with a, a bit of a he faces us with a bit of a puzzle by saying that I want you to be in the world as salt and light, but I don't want you to be of the world. I've sent you to the world to be salt and light, but don't love the world. And you know that 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 uh, uh, is illustrated beautifully in the life of Christ Himself because He had contact time and time again with the world when He lived. Uh, on earth for those uh, 33 years or whatever it was but he didn't experience contamination from the world and we're called to be like him to have contact with the world to be salt and light in the world but not to be contaminated by the world and these word pictures here that he uses uh, are statements or, or, or requirements uh, for each one of us no ifs or buts about it. Our faithfulness as followers of Jesus is measured by the degree to which we meet those two standards. Jesus doesn't say that we're to become like salt or that we will be light at some time in the future. He says we are right now. If you name the name of Jesus, that's what you are. You're salt and you're light, whether you realize it or not. That's our calling. And that's our purpose. Because as soon as we were saved, as soon as we came to know Christ as our Saviour, our job description became that we were to function as salt of the earth and light, the light of the world. And just like salt is a very common commodity today, every, one, every household represented here will have salt somewhere in it. Uh, so too, light uh, it, it's no real big deal for us uh, in this day and age. We have lights, lights on, some people have lights on their key rings uh, or on our, on our cell phones. There's a lovely light on our cell phones that you could use. And without thinking about it, we just flip switches here, there and everywhere when we enter a room and, and often leave them switched on when they should be switched off. And there's probably some lights on in your house right now that haven't been switched off. But you know, things were very different in Jesus' day. Because salt and light in his day were very, both very precious and greatly valued uh, things in that culture. I spoke about the value of salt la last time when we looked at this. And light was also treasured because it was a lot of trouble. He had to go to a lot of trouble and expense to even get the glow of an oil lamp back then. Uh, you know, I remember back in our day when we lived where we lived and there was no electricity and we had Aladdin lamps. Some of you will remember Aladdin lamps. And you had to trim the wick every so often or the house would be full of smoke. And then there was Tilly lamps. You'd have to pump it. And then there was a little gauze thing that you'd put under the, under the, the mantle uh, to get it lit and so on. Uh, but it's very common these days, of course. Electricity, very very common but it was very valuable back then uh, at the glow of an oil lamp back then they had to carry these little clay pots with oil and with wicks and, and then they'd have to have a flint to, to even get a, a flickering sort of light there was no light switches to turn on 
There was no street lights along the roads or anything. And to them, light was a very precious luxury. <coughs> and so when Jesus uses these two images, people would have understood that genuinely devoted disciples were precious to him. They're worth their weight in gold or in salt even. I talked about how salt was that valuable. People were, were, were paid in salt in some instances. And in relation to being salt, listen, we're supposed to be taken out of the, the salt shaker. Salt isn't supposed to stay in the salt shaker. We're supposed to pour it out uh, on, on whatever it is that we're, we're pouring it on. And, and, and we are supposed to be a godly influence wherever it's needed most. Because in the same way that salt adds flavour to food and, and, and light pushes away the depressing shadows of darkness, so real Christ followers should enrich and brighten up the lives of people who, who know them. Devoted disciples bless those around them because they're selfless, they're joyful people that other people like to be around. But unfortunately, you know, this can be an area of our discipleship in which many of us uh, fail or fall down. It's easy, you know, even as Christians, to slip into negativity and to spend our time focusing on, on all the, the, the bad things in life that are going on in our lives even. And some Christians act as if the ability to murmur and complain and find fault is a, a sign of great discernment and spiritual maturity. Listen, good, genuine followers of Jesus are people whose contentment is fueled by their trust in God, <coughs> walking close to Him, living as if they actually believe His promises. <coughs> and because they do, they experience what we talked about before, that eternal, abundant, meaningful life that overflows like being shining lights in a dark and fallen world. You see, someone has said, quite rightly, we must be good news before we can share the good news. There's nothing worse than a Christian trying to share the good news and they're full of negativity. Nobody wants to listen to them. So we must be good news ourselves before we can share good news. You know, early in the Old Testament, God had purposed that Israel would be just like that, set apart to be a shining light amongst all the nations of the world. And so we read in Deuteronomy chapter 26, God declared, and the Lord, the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, you are his treasured possession as he promised, that you are to keep all his commands, he has declared, and that he will set you in praise and fame and honour high above all the nations he has made, and that you will be a people who are holy to the Lord your God as he promised. But you know when we come through history and through time into the New Testament time, we see that the old lamp of Judaism was now a light that had flickered and, 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 and dampened through the centuries and in some ways it had actually gone out. And in the context of Matthew chapter 5 verse 13, Israel was salt now that it had lost its savour. They had been cast out into the street as it were and trodden under the foot of men. So now in verse 14 God removes that privilege from Israel and he shares it now with, with everyone. And we now see that Jesus coming into the world to raise new lights in his church. And over the centuries, Israel, who had once been a light in the world to all the Gentile nations, was now in, in, in a darkness of their own making. And Christ's disciples would have to illumine them. And so Jesus turns to his disciples as he's anticipating leaving the world. And he says, you are the light of the world. You now are the light of the world. And I believe it's one of the greatest statements or, or compliments that has ever been paid to, to, to Christians. In John chapter 9 and verse 5, Jesus says of himself, he says, I am the light of the world. And here he says, you are the light of the world. Calling his disciples, his followers, you and I, 
by the very same name that he calls himself. I could do with a glass of water. Uh, one of you would just grab me a glass of water in the kitchen. <coughs> but isn't that an amazing thing? That we're to be called by the same name that Jesus even calls himself, the light of the world. You remember, not because you were there, but because you've read it, in the book of Genesis, we know that the original state of nature was one of darkness. And it took the act of God coming in and saying, what did God say? What was the first words that he said? Let there be light. To bring light and life into creation. And human nature too was plunged into darkness when original sin entered into our soul. Uh, thanks, Joan. Appreciate that. That'll keep me going for another hour or so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, original sin brought darkness into the soul, souls of men and, and, and of women. Uh, and it's in deep, dense darkness, ignorant of the nature and the character of God, as well as our own state before a holy and righteous God. John chapter 3 and verse 19 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds, the things that they do and think and say, were evil, sinful. And so it's into a world that's shrouded and has been plunged into the deepest darkness that Jesus says to his followers, to his original disciples, and through them to you and to me this morning. You are the light of the world. You are the guides to help people find their way out of, out of the darkness of sin and into his marvellous light. And what a privilege to think that we are lights, perhaps in the darkest hour of history that has ever been. In Philippians chapter 2, in his day, Paul said, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, you, he said, God's people, are to shine as lights. You are to be my light in a darkened world. And I don't know if you fully appreciate this, but in describing Christians, you and I, as salt and light, Jesus is also actually giving us a valuable insight into our own salvation. Did you realize that when you and I trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, an extraordinary miracle took place. Clay became salt and darkness became light. And we read it in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Paul said, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live, live your lives as children of light. And notice he says, you were darkness. And not, now you are in the light, but you are light in the Lord. So live as children of the light. And of course, our light, spiritual light, is derived from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But isn't it a great mystery that although it's from him, somehow it becomes ours, even though we don't contribute one individual ray to the light that we have. And not only that, Jesus also emphatically says, not only you are the light of the world, but he goes on to say, you must let your light shine. We sang it. This is the light of mine. Let it shine. In the biblical context, the Gentiles, if you like, lived down in the valley. To the Jews, they were, they were nothing but dogs. They had no thought of God as far as they were concerned. They didn't seek after God. They worshipped idols and, and they were pagans and idolaters. With, you know, they were regarded as filthy sinners down in the valley. The Israelites, however, lived on a higher plane. They had the God of Israel. They followed the Ten Commandments. They were the chosen people of God. But now Jesus is taking his mission to yet another level, to the church. And Christians are to be lights, like a city on a hill that can't be hidden, he said. Now we, we may prefer or be tempted 
to live in a more comfortable existence, like sort of secret disciples who keep it to ourselves. But Jesus said, if you want to be Christians, who you say you are, you must let your light shine. You must be like a city set on a hill. You must be like a lamp on a lampstand, giving light to the, all of the house. Because the primary function of light is to be visible. It's meant to be seen. Houses in Palestine back in the day were generally darker places. They had no electricity, like I've said. All that they would have had was a little lamp with a, like a, a little uh, sauce bowl filled with, with oil and a wick floating in it. And, and normally they would, they would put that lamp, uh, so called, in a higher place so that it would give light, the greatest effect of light, to the whole room. And that's what Jesus is saying here. That for a city to be set on a hill or a light on a lampstand, the primary duty of light is to be seen. So he's saying to us today, we've got to be seen as Christian. Because someone has said there can be no such thing as a secret disciple or secret discipleship. For either the secrecy will destroy the discipleship or the discipleship will destroy the secrecy. It's a contradiction in terms. We can't be a follower of Jesus and no one knows about it. Do people know you as a Christian? Where you live? Your neighbours? Your workers that you work with? Do they know you to be a Christian? A follower of Jesus? In Mark chapter 7 and verse 24, it says that Jesus, uh, it says of Jesus that he entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. It's like trying to, to hide spread perfume, or to try and hide the, the fragrance of Christ, the Christ's life within us. A life hidden with Christ can't be hidden from others. And listen, Jesus didn't listen. He didn't say, you are the light of the church. He said, you're the light of the world. And so we must be visible to the world. And whether you're young or whether you're older, never be ashamed to be a disciple of Jesus Christ wherever you are and before your friends, your family, your neighbours. It's often unpopular, I suppose, both at school or at work, to commit to live above the sinful ways of the world. But a lamp, a light, has to give light. <clears throat> has to be visible. And secondly, Light, light must be effective. The purpose of the lamp being put on the lampstand is, as Jesus says, to give light to all the house. And that's why he said, don't put it under a bushel, don't put it under a bowl, don't cover it up. It's got to be put in a place where it can influence and help other people. And the place where your light is to shine is given in, in verse 14, the world. That's where we're to shine, in the world, amongst the ungodly, and so on. And that, you know, I thought about this, isn't it wonderful to think that when you give an offering to missions, that that becomes a beam of light to a little child in Ukraine, or, or maybe a, an African orphan. And when we get on our knees and pray for the persecuted church, we're really shining the light of God into a world that we could possibly never be able to go to. That's shining your light. And that's certainly part of what Jesus is meaning here. But I want us to see specifically from verse 15 that he, he says that the light set on a lampstand is to send light to the whole house. And I don't think it's a stretch, it's a stretch to reference this with what Paul said to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, that Christians were to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, for this is pleasing to God, he says. There are many things that we need to do and must not neglect to do, but as someone has said, the light that shines the furthest shines the brightest near at home. We're each called to be the light, not just to the world, but also in the home, where we spend most of our time. It's easy, easy to appear to be a light in the church.
Well, it can be another thing to be a husband and father or a wife and a mother or a son or a daughter in the home and to be a Christ-like light reflector in our attitudes, in our actions, in our speech, a reflector of the light of the world, Jesus himself. That's where it really has to be seen first in the home. Think of it like this, when Jesus was in the world, he was the shining sun, like the shining sun in the day. And when the sun set, what happens? The moon, the moon comes up, still does. And think of the moon as a picture of you and I, of a believer, or of the church, because the moon reflects the light of the sun. The moon doesn't shine with its own light, it shines with the reflected light. And we also need to realize, whether we're comfortable with it or not, that many people in the, in the world observe Christians, look at Christians, to know what's right and wrong. And that's why they're often the ones to point out when we're in, inconsistent as light reflectors. Oh, I thought you were a Christian. I didn't think you'd say that. I didn't think you'd do that. Go there. They're the first to point out the finger. When they're looking to us for the light. So when we dabble in the pleasures and sinful practices of the world, that line of separation becomes blurred. We lose our light glow because we're no longer taking the light to the world. Instead, we're borrowing from the world, from their darkness. And it's sad when that happens. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, You became imitators or followers of us and of the Lord. And that's a very challenging statement because if, we're to put, if we were to put it into our situation, if the men and women outside the church became followers of us, would they find themselves being followers of Christ? What a question. If men and women in the world that we know, that know us, were to follow us, would they find themselves being followers of Jesus? Are we people? Oh, I pray that God would make us the people that others would point to and say, now, that's a Christian man, that, that, that's a Christian woman, that's a Christian young person, I wish I could be like them. So light must be visible, it must be effective, and thirdly, light must not be hidden. Isn't it strange that we, what we wouldn't dream of doing in the natural sense, hide a light under a cover, you light something and then cover it. In the spiritual world, we so often do that. Jesus says, don't hide it. Let it shine. We don't have to, to light it. Or worry about getting it started. All we have to do is to, uh, is to let it do its job. Let his light shine in us and through us. Because we can't stop the light being what it is. But you know we can restrict its glow. There, was, there used to be a TV show. I think it's come on to the British scene now. It was an American TV game show called Survivor. And I think it's, it's, it's on now in, 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 in British TV. And uh, it's a group of people who are on an island and they're doing all sorts of things. But uh, each week the presenter will walk over to someone's torch. They carry these torches. <coughs> and he'll say, the tribe has spoken. And they'll snuff out that particular person's torch or flame. And you see, when our lifestyle is in direct contradiction to the commands of Christ, our, our light as a testimony to the glory of God is as good as being extinguished. With two essential differences from the, the game show. First of all, it's the believer who snuffs out his own flame. And secondly, it's not a game. It's not a game show. It's life. And we need to be wo warned up front that Satan, the deceiver, wants to snuff out your light. And he wants to say that the tribe has spoken. Snuff out that person's light. But we're not a part of his tribe, are we? And the only person who can put out your light, your torch, your lamp, whatever it is, 
is you. You can restrict its flow. And there's one single reason why we should be a light that's shining. And by the way, it's by the way that we live and the things that we say. And that single reason is that we may glorify, Jesus says, our Father who is in heaven. I read a story of a bygone age when uh, single men used to work on the railways and back in their day um, their job was to make sure the railway line was safe for the oncoming train and there was no obstructions or anything on the line that would cause an accident or cause damage or death and this particular signal man was looking out and he saw a tree had fallen over the line and so he grabbed his light it was a lamp a lantern he grabbed his lantern and they would go down the line you know to meet the train to wave the lantern to warn that there was danger ahead there was danger ahead and he warned he did that but the train kept going hit the tree came off the tracks and there was a few people died and of course there was an inquest and at the inquest he was called to give evidence the signal man and he said he was asked did you go down the track and wave your lantern in front of the train to warn them he said yes sir i did and uh, other evidence was given and then uh, a verdict was given and uh, as the signal man was leaving the inquest he said it's a good job they didn't ask me if it was lit <laughs> Good job they didn't ask me if it was lit. <coughs> you see, we're to keep our light shining for one reason, and that's to glorify our Father who is in heaven. And here's a here's a sobering thought this morning. If we're not concerned with God's glory, if we're always hiding our light under a bowl or of one kind or another, whether it's fear or whatever. It means that we're more concerned with our reputation than we're concerned about his glory. And that's always the issue. Oh, I don't know if I should stick my neck out and say something. I might lose my job. What would people think of me? And then we have just decided in those moments that our well-being is more important than the glory of God. If we let our own personality or popularity or prestige or reputation get in the way then the glory of God is dragged down and our flag goes up and we're saying in effect it's all about me instead of what the psalmist says not unto us O Lord not unto us but unto thy great name give glory and one final characteristic of being light is that just as light illuminates something else real maturing disciples live in such a way that they point away from themselves to Christ. I'm reminded of the story of the little boy who was sitting in church with his mother for the first time and as he looked around at the beauty of the stained glass windows in front of him, curiosity finally got the better of him and he said, who are all those people up there? To which his mother responded, well they're saints of the church. And then sensing a teaching moment, she said, do you know what saints are? And she waited until she got his attention and then responded, they're people that the light shines through. People that the light shines through. And that's just what real disciples are like. They're Christ-like in that they let Jesus shine through them. They follow Jesus so closely that they literally let him use them in such a way uh, wherever they are so that they kind of disappear and people see Jesus in them. Candles are not lit to be looked at although there's a lot of expensive candles that people buy these days for show. But candles are lit that something else might be seen. So when Jesus says let your light shine he didn't tell us to, to hold it up and cry out look at me. Look at how good a Christian I am. Am, am I not a good and wonderful person? Don't you wish you were more like me? A light doesn't call attention to itself. It points the way through the darkness. 
And like John the Baptist said, I must, I must decrease and he must increase. We have to live our lives in such a way that people see through us, not for the wrong reasons, but they see through us to see Jesus. I trust that's your desire. That you want to shine visibly, you want to shine effectively, to shine in a way that you're not uh, hidden by cowardice or apathy or silence or inconsistency, and that you shine so that Jesus can be seen. Uh, and, and maybe you're, you're wondering how you can best do this. A man went camping one time and brought a matchbox with him, and when he thought, when he bought it, there was a little sign on the matchbox box that said on it that it glowed in the dark. So when it got dark, he went to strike a match, but he couldn't find the matchbox because it didn't glow in the dark. And so he took a flashlight and looked for it and found it, and then looked at the writing on the side of the matchbox and found, written in French actually, these words, If you want me to shine in the night, keep me in the light. Keep me in the light. It was the light that allowed that matchbox to glow, but it was in a dark place that didn't glow. And we need more than ever in a dark and sinful world to increasingly expose ourselves to the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And notice the challenge. It says in verse 16, let your light shine before men. You can turn on a light in an empty room and it'll, yeah, it'll dispel the darkness, but no one will see it. If, you, if your light's going to shine, somebody has to see it before it'll do any good. And so as we wrap up this teaching this morning, Jesus said two things will happen when you shine your light. First of all, men will see your good deeds, he said. And that word good is kalos, which means attractive, beautiful, lovely, that which is pleasing to the eye. People will, will be attracted to that. Jesus said people will be attracted and drawn to you by the way that you live. And when you say a good word for Jesus, that's a good deed. When you stop and smile at someone, that's a good deed. When you bake something and you give it to a neighbour, or when you stop by a hospital to see how a friend is doing, that's all good deeds. It's evangelism backed up by a winsome personality. So when others see the quality and consistency of your life, they're being drawn through you to Jesus. Jesus could have said, when they hear your great preachers, or when they sit in your lovely churches, or when they hear your wonderful worship, or when they read your statements of faith. He could have said that, but he didn't. He simply said, when they see the way that you live, your Christ-likeness, your reflection of the light, then they'll take notice. Someone has written, and you may have heard this before, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better pupil and more willing than the ear, fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, your tongue too fast may run, the lectures you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might understand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. So Jesus ends with this thought. Verse 16, they will praise your Father who is in heaven. You notice that the word your is used three times in this verse. Your light, your good deeds, your Father in heaven. And when we light or we let our light shine before men, they glorify our Father in heaven. That's how much influence we have. We can point people to Christ. We can lead them out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, what begins on earth will end in heaven. When we do the shining, and God gets the credit and the glory. You see, we have in who we are in Christ an enormous influence for good. 
We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And I can't imagine any greater privilege. We can make an eternal difference to the people around us. So let me end by telling you the most exciting thing about all of this. You don't need a university degree or a Christian college education. If you're a Christian, I cannot emphasize this enough, if you're a Christian, you already are salt and light. You don't need a Bachelor of Salt or a Doctor of Light degree. You have everything you need right now. You're salt. So get out of the salt shaker and into the soup. You're light. So crawl out from under the bowl and let your light shine. There's plenty of darkness in the world, but let's not despair. Because it's precisely when the world is at its worst that the people of God should be at their best. And I believe we were made for days like these. This is our calling. We've been commissioned by Jesus Christ as his followers to go throughout Kutil and, and Cabin and Monaghan and wherever. And yes, we aren't called to save the whole world, but we are called to make a difference where we are. We can't do everything, but by God's grace and God's help, we can do something. And what we can do, we ought to do, because that's what being salt and light is all about. So let's make a difference in the world, in our world wherever we are. Because, listen, after all, all been said and done, we are the only salt and light that the world has. So let's be different. Let's make a difference. As we end this morning, I just want to challenge you to covenant in your heart with me before God that that's what you want to do, to be salt and light. Had special cards or leaflets printed, and it's based on Matthew chapter 5 and these verses. And it says, on the one side, pour out the salt and turn on the light. And it's a commitment card, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hand these out. And it says, as you receive them, well, you'll see what it says. <coughs> and on the back is a, a little thing I talked about. What is a real Christian? What is discipleship really all about? And one of the definitions is this. Discipleship is giving when you feel like keeping. Praying for others when you need prayed for. Feeding others when your own soul is still hungry. Living the truth before people when you can't see results. Hurting for others when your own hurts can't be spoken about. Keeping your word when it's not convenient. Being faithful when your own flesh wants to run away. So I just want you to take one of these for a moment. And just to have a little look at the side that calls for a commitment. I'm not going to ask you to do anything... Uh, weird or wonderful. I'm just going to ask you to look at it and read it through if you can. I'm going to read it for you in just a moment. There's a salt commitment and there's a light commitment. On the one side, when you get it, just quietly just read it through for yourself. And this is just a little flyer. It's big enough to keep in, in your Bible or you can fold it through in your small Bible. You can fit it. See, like I said the last time, or maybe you know, it was Thursday night of the Bible study, it's good to read the Bible, it's good to study the Bible, but the most important thing is application, putting it into practice. I'm not asking you to do this now, but I'm asking you to seriously consider these two commitments. Mindful that I'm not called to save the world, I'm called to make a difference. 
when I can't do everything, I can do something. So what I can do, I ought to do. And a salt commitment. Because you are salt. Today I commit, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, to being a salt influence amongst those that I encounter in daily life as God gives me the opportunity. And I understand that this might mean speaking up unashamedly as a Christian at work or at school, refusing to be involved in certain ungodly behaviours, taking an unpopular stand on public moral issues, taking some criticism or ridicule for my faith. That's what being salt in the world means, partly. And the light commitment. Today I commit as a disciple of Jesus Christ to being a light to illuminate the spiritual darkness around me as God gives me opportunity. And I understand that this may mean holy boldness of my speech and the beauty of my life, deeds of everyday kindness and sacrificing my time for serving others and living my life in such a way that it points people to Jesus and gives the glory to God. And so I'm just going to pause for a moment ask you to consider that and you know I'll just say this uh, commitment is following through what you said you would do when the notion is worn off I want to warn you that when you leave this church in a few minutes and you go out through those doors the notion can wear off very quickly so maybe before you leave this place this morning when God is still speaking to our hearts and minds about these things. You might want to sign that commitment this morning. Put your name to it. Put it in your Bible. Look at it from time to time. And remind yourself that you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. Let's just pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for making it so clear to us who we are in you. We can get so caught up in so many different theological uh, things that we lose sight of the simple fact that we are the salt of the earth and you've called us to be the light of the world. And Lord, you have made us who we are and we each have different gifts and different abilities and you have placed us just where we are. We're not in the family we are or in the, in the, the neighborhood where we are, in the community where we are by accident. For such a time as this, you have placed us where we are. And so, Father, help us to be salt and light just where we are. Not to hide our light under a bushel or under a bowl. Not to allow our saltiness to become unsavoury. But help us, Lord, to be a people who are uh, able to influence just by the, who we are and what we say and what we do. Uh, uh, to, to influence those around us to at least consider Christ, if not come to Christ. So Father, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided everything that we need to live a holy life before you and before the world. Help us, Lord, to be just what you have called us to be, to be salt and light. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Just to sing one more song. Time